Now it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome to the show tonight, the live raffle show for Hidabrut, Rabbi Yossi Mizrahi. Now many people, I'll tell you, every Tuesday morning I get a text. Who is on now? So if you want to know, you want to see the face of Rabbi Yossi Mizrahi, he's on every Tuesday morning talking about all of these interesting topics to make you believe in the Rabbi Yossi and make you believe in Hashem. And I know that many people show up to his lectures, and he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Now, uh, I see here it says that you have a website, divineinformation.com, which you're going to tell us about. Rabbi Mizrahi, welcome to the program. Welcome to the show. How are you? My pleasure. Thank you very much. So the voice, we know. Now we see the face. And before, I'm, I'm, you know what Hidabrut is. We're going to get in to see what you do and what you, and, and see how you, how you're bringing many uh, Jewish neshamas back to Klai Yisrael, back to Yiddishkeit, back to Judaism. But Hidabrut is something that's close to you. How did you get involved in Hidabrut? How did you, what do you think about Hidabrut? And give us some, and obviously tell them to call the number to win that raffle tonight. Yeah, so uh, it's obvious today that uh, when you speak about Kiru, uh, it became an international organization. Hidabrut, everyone knows Hidabrut. Hidabrut is the main and the most famous uh, organization. In, uh, up to recently, it was all in Hebrew. Now it's expanding to English. And as you can see in New York and in America and through the internet worldwide, there's many listeners who begin to understand that there's such a large audience that speaks only English. And uh, we are trying to expand to different kinds of audiences that we didn't have before. And I see that, like you said, every Tuesday, as soon as the show is over, I'm flooded with phone calls and emails and people searching for CDs. So you see the impact that the radio I actually has. got very nervous yesterday because you said you might stop making CDs on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I said, so what's the story? Are you stopping it's, or it's you still It's all about just... budgets. The more requests I have, <laughs> then I have to worry where will I get the funds to make an extra 10, 20,000. But uh, with, the Hashem's, truth, with Hashem's help, it's been working very well. Yes. The truth is you're inspiring many people. Now, obviously, one part of what you do is, is uh, that, that radio show that you do. But you go all over and you speak and you give lectures. What is it that you find? People want to do care. If people want to bring people back, back to Yiddishkeit, what is it that you feel? Uh, if you bring it to, the, to their attention, the importance of Kiruv, then they, they get the point, they understand and they try to do. But I always say to people, not everyone is a great speaker, not everyone is a Talmud Chacham, not everyone knows the information, but there are many ways to participate. So I always say to the wealthy people, open your wallet. The people who have the talents with computer, use your talent to expand, to get to people who would never hear any, any words of Torah. And many people understand that even someone who never believed he can be a part of a system of a Kiruv is playing a very serious role by advertising, by publishing, by sending emails, by arranging lectures. Uh, I mean, I have people that only a few months ago became Balei Tshuva. I had the school to bring them back. And now already they are organizing seminars in wow. months. Or in Canada, in Toronto, in Europe, in Israel. I just came back from Eretz Israel. I mean, uh, advertising minutes. In minutes, you have large audiences everywhere. I mean, two weeks ago, I was in LA. You come, you see hundreds of people waiting already for three and a half hours, both nights. Three and a half hours, almost nobody le leaving. People are sitting for three and a half hours listening, and then they stay an extra hour after the lecture, grabbing the CDs, and, that, and you see what's happening. So if you want to support the Kirov movement, the Kirov movement of today, Hida Brut, Call right now, 877-HIDABRUT, 877-443-2276, 877-443-2276, or hidabrutraffle.org. Remember, if you bought already, first of all, it's only $120 to join, but if you bought already, for $100 more, you could receive uh, five more tickets into the raffle and support the amazing work, bringing back many, many Yiddish Neshamas, bringing back Jewish Neshamas. And I said earlier, Rabbi Mizrahi, and I think you'll agree with me, and I think you actually said this yesterday morning on your lectures that you were talking about different technology, but I remember when I was growing up, television was the worst thing in the world. And the reason television was the worst thing in the world is because you're bringing things that don't belong in a Jewish home into your home. And I think the effect that Hidabrut in Israel has, these people, it's bringing the 
kosher television and kosher programming into people that would never reach out to other programming. Whether and now it's on the internet and it's on and, and, and your type of lectures and things like that that people could be inspired. So first of all, what made you decide to become part of a curve movement and, and give lectures and be makar of people to back to Yiddish? That's a good question. That was uh, almost 17 years ago. Uh, I was much younger than today, with no, no gray hair. <laughs> and I started to see that almost every friend of mine that is not from, that is not uh, keeping mitzvot, that I'm speaking to him about some of the lecture I myself were listening to, uh, it's uh, affecting them. And some of them started to participate, to come to Shabbos meal. And I started to see myself that maybe that's my direction in life. And of course, you know, Hashem show every Jew what's his purpose in life. Uh, with this success, you become hungry. <laughs> and then what happened is I started to see that it's growing tremendously until, uh, until came the website. The website came uh, as uh, two of my ballet tshuva, husband That's and wife. Information the Divine Information dot com. A computer programmer. One day they came to me. You have to understand I was very primitive at that time. And one day they come to me and say, we made you a website. They See, if they tell me in advance, I want to make your website, I wasn't into it. I didn't understand the power of a website. So we made your website. All you have to do is just record yourself. I wasn't recording the lectures. We're talking about eight years ago, something like that. So about 10 years of lectures, none of it was recorded. Maybe few by a tape, primitive. And then once they forced me already that I have a website, I might as well use it. Then obviously I started to record. In the beginning it was only audio. And then what happened is, I realized that maybe we should do video. But the truth is that uh, two of the people who used to come to my lectures is their brother called Yaakov. They came to me one day, about five, six years ago, and they said, what do you think? Maybe we should start recording your lectures on video, and we bring it to the houses of people that will never attend to a lecture. Right. I say, great idea. So all we have to do is get a camera, and we will... <laughs> same oh, lecture, same and, work on your and, part. And listen to the story. And, we, and we'll make a website, and we'll bring you to the people who will never come. I say, fantastic. So we started together one of the most successful websites in the world today, Torah Anytime. So TorahAnytime.com, we started it. I was, you know, in the beginning it was 20, 30 of my lectures. Then, as I told you before, if you see the system is working, you might as well improve it and expand it to as many people as you want. And today, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's more than 15,000 lectures by more than 300 of the best speakers in the world on Torah Anytime. And uh, like I say, the last years, Idabrut uh, is the pioneer, the power, everyone is, is expanding everywhere. I remember coming to the offices a few years ago when they, when they took the big building with many rooms, they were preparing the place. I was thinking to myself, the way it started and what it became, it's an incredible miracle. And that was a few years ago. Now today it's much, much, much bigger, and I'm very happy that now it's in America, it's the United States, it's worldwide. All over. So for, to participate in this amazing care of movement, to bring back many people, call right now, 877-HIDABRUT, 877-443-2276. 443-2276 or hidabrutraffle.org. Now, you have many different topics and, uh, you know, we, every time you have, have a lecture or whatever, I, I, we might be giving you only a, you know, a short time, but we told that you could prove Torah scientifically. Yes. So, we're going to give our audience a little bit, uh, a little bit of Rabbi Yitzhak Mizrahi for the next few minutes and he's going to try, or I'm assuming he will succeed, to prove to you that Torah, si Torah scientifically, Rabbi Yitzhak Mizrahi. I, 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 what basically, what's, uh, today what I find whenever I go is one of the main reasons why people are not keeping Torah and mitzvot, they're not into Judaism, is not because they're evil or they have uh, you know, different kinds of reasons. The main really reason is ignorance, that people really have no idea what Judaism is all about. They don't know what the Torah is. They listen to all kinds of negative things in the media, in the secular media. And this kind of, this kind of, you know, of people, obviously, they brainwash against the Torah and against Judaism in general. And they jump to conclusions which are completely wrong. And here comes a person like me. I come with my laptop and a projector. And I present all the proofs from the Talmud. Mainly, I try always to use examples 
from the oral Torah. Why? Because the written Torah, most people still, when I, when I meet with them, they already have some kind of idea that it's divine. But when we begin to speak about the Talmud, the Gemara, then uh, they right away, they, they have a lot of doubts, and they say, oh, no, no, the rabbis made it up. And then I begin to show some of the proofs, and then they are amazed. For instance, I made a film, it's called Torah and Science. It's a four-hour film. It's divided to three different uh, sessions. First uh, hour, it's proving that uh, Mount Sinai really happened in reality. It's not just a, a story. It can prove scientifically that all the Jews, millions of Jews, were standing 3,322 years ago and receiving the Torah live when Moshe and Hashem is speaking and everyone is, is listening. How can you prove something like that? You can go into the uh, Torah and science film and you see that it's very convincing because there's one proof after the other. If one would not do it, then the second or the third or the fourth, but when you hear 20, 30 proofs one after the other, uh, in my opinion, it leaves no doubt. And the second part is all the scientific knowledge of Chazal, of our sages, that leaves no doubt that no human being had an ability to know such things. Uh, the number of the stars in the universe. Up to 400 years ago, everyone thought there's maximum between six to 8,000 stars. And here comes the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page Lamed Bet 32, and gives a description of all the galaxies and the number of the stars and the 12 sections that Hashem created and all the, the stars and, and billions and trillions of stars. And today we prove this, uh, NASA is coming to the same number. Now remember, this is in a generation there's no satellite and there is no mega computer. You need a computer the size of a building uh, to count such numbers. Nobody had that ability. And then you can, today we go retroactive and we see that they had divine information. And the best part is that none of these rabbis, Chazal, are trying to get credit for their discoveries. It's not even a discovery. It's they all admitting that this is information who was passed from generation to generation at that time, it was 1,300 years of transferring the divine knowledge from one rabbi to his student until eventually it was written in a Talmud. Uh, I, I, I give an example of the renewal of the moon. The renewal of the moon, all the, uh, all the cycles of the moon, the Gemara said the minimal cycle of the moon will never be less than 29.530. 590. This is six digits after the decimal points in a generation that people did not even have a simple calculator. And uh, I show NASA and the Germans with billions of dollars of research, each one of them separately, which took many years, with thousands of employees involved in the research, coming to the same exact number of the Talmud in a very primitive generation, with the difference of one ten thousand of a second, the, the renewal of the moon in all the possible cycles. Obviously, a person was never able to write such a thing. Or the information about all the species in, in the ocean, all the fish, all the things that live in 72% of the world is water. And obviously, no person can watch the entire world simultaneously and know what exists, what doesn't exist. And especially when it was written, half of the species in the oceans did not even exist. And today, they obviously artificially or, or naturally, they, are, they always mix. And there's new species coming to the world every generation. And the Torah promise you never find anything that has scales and did not have fins. And up to this moment, nobody ever found. Uh, or I give another example. Uh, we read. Uh, in Tehillim, we, we pray every morning, for those who pray every morning, Tfilat Shachrit, we say that King, King David is calling God, is calling the heaven to praise God. And what does he say? The water that under the heaven and the water above the heaven. And everyone was wondering, what water is talking about? Is this metaphoric? Is, what, is he speaking to water that really do not exist? And today, with the help of the scientific uh, research, the scientists prove that there are stars that are one huge chunk of ice that one of them already have a thousand times more water than Earth. 
even though 72% of the world is water right here, one star um, among all these billions that have a huge, thick level of ice, <coughs> it's already more water than this world. And in uh, Chazal, in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, they say that there are much more water above heaven than water under the heaven. And today, with the help of technology, we find that they know what they're talking about. But remember, this is not a research, a scientific research by Chazal, by our sages. None of them ever claim that they have these uh, skills of being a scientist. Uh, I can give another example. Uh, everybody knows Benjamin Frank Franklin. When you ask the average American who was Benjamin Franklin, they say it was the President of the United States. Why his picture is on the, on the hundred dollar bill, the old one. The truth, he wasn't the President of the United States, even though many Americans think. He was a, a great politician and an activist, and he was, a, you know, he was a famous person about 250 years ago. And he's the one who found that when the lightning strike, then the, play, the people that would stand in the in highest place are more in danger than the people that are in the lowest place. And there's anything, if you put a medal on the top of the city in one of the highest buildings, it will protect the life of all the people. And when we review the words of Chazal, remember this is more than 2,000 years ago, Chazan said, if a person put metal, piece of metal in between his animal, the sheep, if he does it because he wants to do a black magic, like the way of the Emory, the nation, one of the nations who lived in Israel, he wants to multiply his sheep, that he will have more animals to sell to make more money, then it's not allowed because the Torah said that the Jew is not allowed to use these tricks. But if he, if he does it to protect the life of the sheep, of the animal, then there's no problem. From the lightning, the Chazal writes clearly, if he puts the piece of metal above his sheep to protect the life of the sheep from the lightning, then it's allowed. So here is an example of a huge scientific discovery that nobody in colleges ever paid attention to. It's very interesting. Everyone gives credit to Benjamin Franklin and he deserves his credit. But 1700 years before he was born, Chazal were talking about it just by the way, without even making a big deal. To conclude, because I know my time is running out, there are thousands of thousands of things in the Talmud, in the Kabbalah, in the written Torah that leaves no doubt that the Torah, the written and the oral Torah, or everything in Judaism is 100% divine. The source of everything that we learn is 100% divine and it can never be written by human being. Now when we know that, it's much, much easier to become an observant and to follow the instructions of God, knowing the creator of the world gave me this instruction, it's much, much easier for me to follow. Very good. Thank you very much, Rabbi Mizrahi. Unbelievable words. Again, you can catch him every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock on 97.5 and on RadioHidabru.com. Thank you. And uh, keep up all your great work. And uh, Mitz Hashem will uh, hopefully hear and see much, much more from you. You're doing unbelievable. And it's great to be on the same network with you. It's unbelievable. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much my Rabbi. pleasure. All the very best. Good.